Technoculture. Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I am Federica Bressan, and today my guest is Jose Siles, radio frequency engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Welcome to Technoculture, Jose. Thank you, Federica. Thank you for having me today. So this podcast is a lot about learning about technology and also how it impacts society. And when one thinks of state-of-the-art technology, thinks of NASA because state-of-the-art technology and oftentimes large-scale infrastructures are involved in the research that you do. Can you talk a little bit about what research is being done today here? What is the main or what are the research questions? Well, Jet Propulsion Laboratory is, uh, I'm sure that everyone knows what it is, but for those that are not familiar with JPL, it was actually the first NASA center. It was created before NASA existed in 1936 uh, by actually four students of Caltech that they were doing research on rockets. And one day they almost blew up a, a building there at campus, so they were <laughs> <laughs> sent out to here close to, to the, the mountains, mountains here in Pasadena. Uh, they were really, really interested in their research. But they were not that interested in <laughs> in breaking buildings, so uh, so they encouraged to come here and continue their research. And actually, in Halloween 1936, they have the first, let's say, successful launch where they have this rocket that lifted up uh, a few centimeters and then uh, fell down, exploded. But it was the first time that a rocket lifted up, so that was the, actually the first day of JPL. And then many years after, in 1958, when NASA was created, uh, JPL became part of NASA. And since then, you know, JPL has run a lot of missions for NASA, like Cassini, um, Galileo, all the Mars rovers, Juno more recently, uh, the Voyagers, uh, which are now the only man-made spacecraft that are out of the solar system. So nowadays, JPL just leads the robotic exploration for NASA to explore the solar system and even beyond, you know, if we go to astrophysics uh, missions and all that. So. And you are a radio frequency engineer, so what is your expertise? Uh, what type of research you participate in? Uh, so my research is mostly uh, developing science instruments for uh, uh, studying, for example, we talk about planetary science to try to detect water and its compositions in ocean walls. Basically, it's like moons of other planets where we there's liquid water and we could think that maybe that water uh, can have some kinds of life. Uh, so with these instruments we can detect that water from far away, uh, you know, the composition of that water. We can even use that technology uh, to, for example, understand climate. So for example, to improve the weather predictions, if we look into the clouds and try to detect, for example, humidity in clouds. And we can apply the same kind of technology for astrophysics to mostly study star formation. So how do stars form? So it's not all about outer space. It's also about monitoring climate on Earth. So there are applications for Earth. Of course. I mean, there are three main areas of research, uh, astrophysics, planetary science, and Earth. And of course, uh, taking care of our own planet is uh, one of the key uh, goals of NASA and JPL. And what kind of technology is involved in the research that you do? The technology or the, the part of the of the science where I work on is the far infrared. And the technology we develop is to study the universe in the far infrared. So the far infrared is is this range of the electromagnetic spectrum which is between optical emissions and the microwaves. The microwaves is the frequencies uh, at which your cell phone, for example, works. Uh, so 98% of the photons emitted since the beam bang and 50% of the total luminosity falls in that frequency range. So it's very important to understand the universe and to study other planets and atmosphere of planets and so on. But it's very difficult to create technology on that region just because it happens to be there kind of in the middle of nowhere in terms of technology. So you have to actually use technology that everyone has nowadays, like anything that you can find in your home, you know, like microwave technology and all that, and try to multiply that up to go to these higher frequencies, which is 10,000, 20,000 higher than, for example, your cell phone, and use it to detect signal from the sky. So for example, these circuits that we design, they will fit in a piece of your hair. So they are really, really small. Now, the Antarctica connection is just uh, not because we're really in this technology study things darkly there, but we go to Antarctica because we want to launch radio telescope from there to go to the stratosphere 
and look to the stars from the stratosphere. And the reason is that the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere, block all these signals, mostly because of the water vapor. So we really need to go very high to look at these signals. And, you know, of course, using a balloon to launch this radio telescope to the stratosphere is cheaper than a space mission. So it allows us to test new technology uh, before it can actually be infused into a, a space mission. And can you talk a little bit about the balloon technology? It sounds so simple <laughs> and it sounds so non-futuristic technology. It almost reminds me of hot air balloons. Well, it's, uh, that's the idea, right? It's uh, like doing astronomy like in the old days. Uh, uh, actually, one of the first, if not the first, scientific balloon was in 1912 by Victor Hess. He didn't went all the way up to the stratosphere, but um, uh, he used a balloon, and he was actually riding himself in the balloon, and he just was going uh, up in altitude, I think, and up to five kilometers or something like that. And he was trying to measure with a detector the radiation as a function of altitude. He discovered the cosmic rays, and then he got a Nobel Prize in 1936 because of that. So since then, there have been more than 10,000 scientific balloon missions. Um, when did people stop? going up with a balloon, you know, because clearly you don't today for the altitude and yeah. for other reasons. Well, for scientific reasons, I think in the early 90s, but I think there are some missions in the late 890 or something like that. I mean, I don't recall right now the numbers, but yeah, you're correct. Nowadays, when we go to the stratosphere, you don't take people with you. The instrument, you know, the telescope goes up and you just control it from the ground. But we use helium balloons, uh, so very large balloons. Uh, they're like in diameter 400 feet. So that's like a football field. It's 130 meters in diameter, and it has 40 million cubic feet of helium inside. So it's massive, and the radio telescope can weigh up to even 5,000 pounds. So, so the balloon is needed to lift the machinery? Yeah. And how precisely can you control it? Can you, like, you know... Don't go there, come back. You're well, we control the pointing of the telescope. The balloon goes up to 130,000 feet. At least our mission, you can go slightly higher, or slightly lower, depends on the weight of your specific uh, technology and, you know, and your science requirements. You go up there, and when we fly from Antarctica, we use something called the uh, Antarctic vortex, which is some winds that circulate around the continent. So what it happens is the balloon goes up and then keeps circulating around continent, so it doesn't drift off continent. And after the mission, that allows you to land and recover the instrument and, and update the, the technology and fly again. You cannot control where the balloon is during the flight because it just goes with the wind. But you can very precisely control the pointing. So what you do is the telescope is actually correcting for the position and you are constantly pointing at your target. So you're looking at the star forming region. The telescope is constantly looking to that. So we can control the elevation of the telescope and the azimuth of the telescope, but not the overall position of the gondola. Every time you go on a mission like this, I believe that you have more than one question. You collect different types of data. It's not one mission, one project, or is it? Well, um, there are a lot of things to do, so every mission starts with a scientific question, right? And it could be a, like a broad question, like where we're coming from or how life originated on Earth, or could be, could there be life in any other place in the solar system or elsewhere? For example, if we just take the sample of this balloon mission, uh, which are very popular now, what we're trying to understand is how a star forms. Uh, and you will think, why? <laughs> why is it important uh, how the stars form? Well, l let's take a step back. Um, so you think that the Milky Way, just the Milky Way, our galaxy has between 100 and 400 billion of stars? And I'm asking you a question now. Can you imagine how many uh, galaxies are in the universe? Um, too many for <laughs> my little brain. Okay, yeah, so now yeah. you multiply for the number of stars, average stars in a galaxy. And yeah, I'm it's sure mind-blowing. Yeah. yeah. So, so what is clear, there are a lot of stars in the universe. So with so many stars, they have to play a, a key role in, in the galactic evolution, how galaxies evolve, how the universe evolves. So... And Beyond that, I mean, all the molecules, all the atoms that form our bodies are originated in the stars. For example, the carbon comes from the stars. So you study how a star forms, how those molecules form, how they are 
you know, how that cycle, you know, because star forms and then eventually it dies uh, and all that material is ejected again and goes through several cycles. So you want to understand where we're coming from. Somehow you need to understand how the stars form. And if you want to understand, it could be life elsewhere, uh, you know, star formation is also a good place to start to understand how that material is combined or into, pl uh, into planet formation and all that. So at the end, we're trying to contribute to answering this NASA question, which is where we're coming from. Could you give some example in simple terms of the impact of the applications of this research, if, if any, like in the short term or end in the long term? Yeah, sure. At the end, all the knowledge that we do for these missions I use for f in the ground, you know, for near term for humankind or for humans. So, for example, the same technology we use for this mission in astrophysics or even planetary science, it could be used to develop uh, imaging systems for biomedicine or medicine. So in the near or midterm, it could be used to improve uh, how we are able to predict diseases or to detect uh, diseases in the early stages like cancer, um, Alzheimer, diabetes, diseases like that. So actually we're working in a small project with the NIH to try to infuse this technology on some of their system for early detection of diseases, as I said. Uh, we can use the same technology to study climate uh, or weather. So we recently flown actually in January and December, January this year and December last year, uh, similar technology on an airplane, on a NASA airplane. And we're looking the humidity profiles inside the clouds and that helped the um, uh, climatologists to understand better how weather works and to improve weather predictions. And that's something that is the first time that has been done. Uh, and it's technology that was de actually developed initially for astrophysics. So there are a lot of uses and that's, as an engineer also is the, is the assignment of that, not only uh, creating technology for studying the universe or other planets, but also to give back to humans and help to improve our life on Earth or create a technology that can help us in the future, especially if we can cure diseases or help to, to cure diseases. And that is something that many people, I'm sure, don't know, that NASA is associated with uh, space explorations, but it actually goes from medicine to predicting the, the weather, monitoring the climate. And this type of research is clearly multidisciplinary. It requires the contribution of many different experts. What disciplines are involved in this? Uh, pick any mission you want, and probably you have plenty of them. Uh, in an astrophysic mission, of course, you have astrophysicists, you have engineers, uh, you have uh, physicists. Chemists? Uh, well, yeah, of course. I mean, astrophysicists are chemists in the end, I mean, well, it's, uh, it's all part of that. But then if you go to planetary science, you have geologists, uh, you could have astrobiologists, uh, it's pretty much everything you can think of. And the human factor is very important in this type of research. You have mentioned it in some of your previous talks. You say this is teamwork. Can you talk a little bit about the human factor in executing such complex plants, large-scale plants that require lots of preparation? Well, teamwork is the key. Um, I always say that you cannot land something on Mars with thousands of people if people don't get along. So it's a, working at JPL or at NASA in general is like, or if you go to a specific project, it's like working uh, in a family. You know, I come to work and I, I just come to play with my friends. It's a little bit like how it feels. Uh, so. It's a very nice environment where you really are so excited to make a mission work, to go to another planet, land a rover in another planet, fly a radio telescope to the stratosphere, that basically everyone wants to make it happen. Everyone wants to help each other to, to accomplish the task. Everyone wants to learn from each other. We have the best on each part, you know, in specific balloon mission again, you, you have people that take care of the gondola, people that take care of the antenna, people that take care of the receivers, people that take care of the mechanical drawings. So they are the best on their field and just have the opportunity to work with all these people and learn and, and all together become better. So yeah, it's key. And then if we factor in the Antarctica factor, which is basically the fact that now you're going there for a couple of months um, building this or reassembling this radio telescope there. So you spend with your team 24 hours a day during two months in a row. You know, that's the typical question. It's either you hate each other or you love each other. 
and normally the the answer is the latter. I mean, you get s so close to each other, uh, you get to know each other so well, and that actually helps the mission because you can just look at uh, your colleague to the eye and you know what he's thinking. You, you know, it's just amazing. And of course, you trust each other a lot. To conclude, would you like to say what you're working on right now? Well, uh, we were selected for a new Antarctic flight. It's a larger telescope that we have flown before. We went actually in Antarctica in 2015, 2016. This new mission is going to fly in 2023. This is the normal life cycle, like one of these missions, preparation, go there, collect the data, come home, analyze the data, takes five years or so? Well, balloon missions are lower budget and they are missions that are uh, somehow accelerated. You try to do it faster with the lower budget, but you want to take some risks and try to infuse or test new technologies that, and as I said before, can be afterwards used in space mission. So a long mission is four or five years, uh, more or less. You just talk to a space mission, well, it could be from 10 years to sometimes even 20 years. Imagine you go to Jupiter, that takes five to seven years to get there. Uh, you know, that mission cycle is much, much longer. And of course, you, you have many more instruments. Uh, they are much larger missions. So it depends on the kind of mission. So, But for balloons, yeah, it's, it's four or five And I interrupted years. you. You were saying you were selected to participate in the next. Yeah, so we're building, a, in this case, another radio telescope uh, for the far infrared. Uh, we're going to study, again, star formation. But we're going to use this time a 2.5 meter telescope, which is large. It's the largest or one of the largest has ever been flown from a balloon platform. And the reason of using a large telescope, or at least one of the reasons to use that large telescope is because we want to look not only inside our galaxy, but also in other galaxies. We want to compare how a star forms in different galaxies, in different states, to complete or to try to understand better this whole star forming cycle. Thank you very much for taking the time and for being on Technoculture. Thank you.